Hello, everybody. Um, uh, first of all, thank you so much for um, inviting the Coca-Cola Company to uh, uh, take part in this important event in Australia, and personally to, for inviting me down to Sydney. I've never been to Sydney before, and uh, I was so excited. I, um, I really was like a schoolboy. I travel all over the world, and um, I, you get a bit blasé about um, uh, where you travel to. And I couldn't wait to get off the plane and start exploring this beautiful city um, uh, that is Sydney. I even faced one of my fears yesterday, and I did the bridge climb. I was the weird, freaked out black guy at the <laughs> back of the line, um, because I am frightened of heights. Uh, but it was, it was just a sensational four-hour experience. So it's really, really lovely to be here. So thank you. Um, one of the reasons why, I guess, we've been invited uh, to come and uh, share some of our thinking with you guys is because um, uh, Coke has had uh, an incredible five or six years uh, in terms of our own creative agenda. In 2004, we had a, a chief exec, a chairman and chief exec, South African guy called Neville Isdell, and he declared the Coca-Cola company creatively bankrupt. Now, when your chief exec is saying that you're creatively bankrupt, you've really got a problem. Um, uh, but what he did is he invested um, in creative talent all over the world uh, to come and join the Coca-Cola company from different creative industries uh, to really start to take um, responsibility for our own creative agenda and really start to put creativity as a clear competitive advantage. And uh, I'm really, really proud of the momentum that um, uh, the company has had all over the world not least the creative momentum that the Coca-Cola um, business unit here in uh, uh, Australia has had. Uh, thanks to the Australian business unit, we are the creative marketer of the year at Cannes this year. And uh, uh, the country that won more awards than any other country was actually Australia. So thank you very, very much, my Australian BU. Really, really, really proud. So coming out of Cannes, uh, last year, we built this website called the Coca Cola Company at can.com. It's got public access, and basically, it's got all of the work uh, on there that we won awards for. Um, and uh, those awards include two Grand Prix, 31 Lions. Uh, they're across three brands, not just Coca Cola, but uh, Sprite and Coke Zero also um, picked up uh, a lot of metal. Uh, four regions, which was really, really important to us, because usually, for whatever reason, the Latin Americans. Um, managed to dominate every single global award show that Coca-Cola gets entered into. Uh, but this year, Asia Pacific actually dominated Latin America. So, you know, uh, I'm really excited about this year's can because the Latin Americans are coming back with a real gusto. But um, I also wrote a paper coming out of uh, can last year uh, talking about the correlation between creativity and commercial success because I absolutely believe that the most creative brands in the world are also some of the most uh, commercially successful brands. Uh, and that paper can also be found on this website. And uh, I was really pleased because Fast Company picked up that paper and they ran it as a feature um, uh, as well. And I think that if anybody challenges uh, the value of creativity, uh, then there's lots of good uh, data evidence in that paper that helps uh, you build an argument for outstanding creativity. OK, um, I, you'll also find me uh, on Twitter. I spend a lot of time on Twitter. I get into trouble um, by the management at Coca-Cola um, uh, back in Atlanta, because sometimes I spend too much time on Twitter and engage in the wrong con kind of conversations. But it's really important for me, as I travel around the world, to continue to learn uh, from different creators in different markets. And so uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with me, then you can um, do that on Twitter. Right, what I'm going to uh, do today is I'm going to take you through Content 2020. Content 2020 is our public declaration on how we as a company, a company that operates in 206 markets, is going to approach um, at this new evolved consumer landscape um, and how we're going to put our creative agenda as a single central um, manifesto of which then we um, inspire creators all around the world uh, to help us achieve. Now, I'm going to start by taking you through some very basic principles of creativity and how creativity works for the Coca-Cola company and how we approach uh, creativity. Um, and then I'm going to narrate a film um, that I first narrated in Cannes last year. Uh, but it's evolved slightly because, can you believe it, the first time I actually narrated this film, uh, we didn't even mention 
the word mobile. Um, uh, that's how quickly the world's um, uh, marketing agenda is evolving. So um, we've had to update and we'll continue to update uh, uh, the company's content 2020 manifesto. Okay, um, uh, the first thing, it's always good to start any kind of presentation with a, uh, with a quote. And this is um, uh, from a professor that I studied uh, under at Harvard Business School. And um, uh, this quote that I take from one of his um, uh, tutorials is uh, really significant. Creativity is a crucial variable in the process of turning knowledge into value. And what I mean by that is basically um, we have pretty much the very same access to the very same data as our biggest competitor. And even though big data is a, a new buzzword in marketing, to be absolutely honest um, uh, with you as far as we're, we're concerned, um, it's not what uh, data you have access to, but it's what you do with that data. And if you've got creative people who can read that data and turn pretty much the same data as everybody else has got access to into really, really valuable insights that's going to drive your business. And nobody works at the Coca-Cola company or on Coca-Cola company brands from a creative perspective without understanding that we're in the business of driving shareholder value and we see creativity as a competitive advantage that is going to lock greater, unlock greater shareholder value um, uh, uh, for our shareholders than that of our competitors. Now, um, uh, we, as you'd expect us to do, given the size of our business, have studied academically some serious creators uh, in our lifetimes. And when Steve Jobs uh, passed away uh, uh, two years ago now, I made a commitment that I would never make a creative presentation publicly uh, that actually didn't um, use one of his most enduring legacies, and that is uh, his to the crazy ones. I really believe that everybody in this room is somebody who believes that creativity can transform uh, their lives for the better. And it doesn't matter if that's uh, just you in your family context, or you in your office context, or you in your social context, or you in a broader business sense. Um, uh, I really do believe that everybody has an opportunity uh, to think more consciously about creativity and see how creativity can really help their world, personal, social, business, or indeed the bigger um, uh, world, a better place. And these words, I think, are some of the most valuable words about creativity um, that uh, we could ever hear. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them, because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. So powerful. The people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. And that's an invitation that I would um, put out there to all of you guys over the next three days uh, uh, to take ideas and thoughts and inspiration so that you can change your world um, uh, for the better. Okay, other, other creators that we admire. We're one of the biggest purchasers of um, uh, uh, film uh, content in the world. So, of course, we've got to study brilliant film. And so we've studied Steven Spielberg from an academic perspective so we understand um, how and why uh, he continues uh, to be the world leader in um, uh, outstanding film storytelling. Uh, Maya Angelou, I'm um, a big fan of Maya Angelou, and I'm also a big champion of the art of copy. And I worry that uh, uh, one thing that technology uh, seems to be um, uh, getting in the way of is um, how uh, powerful the use of words can be. And uh, so going back to study Maya Angelou and how she uses words, 
as an author, she can smash your heart open um, in two or three sentences, and then the very next sentence, she can stitch it back together again. Uh, really, really, really powerful author who we've studied. Also, Madonna. Why would we um, have studied Madonna? Uh, well, she's been at the forefront of her uh, competitive industry for 32 years. And uh, she stands for three things. She stands for fierce, independent womanity. Nothing gets in the way of her cutting edge, fierce approach to creativity. Nothing gets in the way of her independence. And nothing gets in the way of her womanity. Um, Coca-Cola is very, very similar. For the last 175 years, we've stood for um, uh, happiness. Now, uh, the, nobody comes to the Coca-Cola company, no agency works on Coca-Cola uh, to try and rethink our strategic position for that brand. But what we all have to do is we all have to read popular culture uh, better than any of our competitors uh, to make sure that our expression of happiness is relevant to a ever-changing um, uh, consumer base. And that's what Madonna does. Her and her team read popular culture to make sure that those three values uh, stay as contemporary and as relevant uh, to her target audience as any of her competitors who come in and come out of um, uh, uh, popular culture. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, we've studied uh, him, and that's because <coughs> we um, see so many great ideas that get lost or diluted or dissolved or evaporated in any organization simply because we haven't had the people behind those ideas who have got the communication skills to uh, be able to articulate these new ideas and fire up motivation and inspiration and momentum behind them. So studying how Dr. Martin Luther King um, uh, actually got some of his ideas to be accepted um, by his community, by his country, and by the world at large is something that's very, very important for any multinational organization trying to get new ideas accepted and uh, approved. And then, of course, we study um, the Google boys. Uh, any brand that is rivaling Coca-Cola as being one of the world's most valuable brands has to be studied. But interestingly, what we study with uh, Google is actually their organizational strategy uh, in terms of a, uh, making sure that creativity, the creative process, and as John said earlier on, the space for creativity is baked into Google's organizational culture. Um, this is another interesting um, uh, quote which um, I always refer back to, particularly when I'm dealing with my uh, agency partners. And um, this is that creativity is about seeing what everybody has seen and thinking what nobody has thought. Another way to put that is creativity should be a glimpse of the blindingly obvious. So if creativity seems to be too hard, too complex, I can't call up my mom and explain to my mom in 60 seconds on the phone what it is that I'm trying to um, uh, execute with this creative idea, then chances are it's a bad creative idea. Creativity should be so obvious that it feels almost familiar. Because the best creative ideas out there are the ones that feel incredibly familiar the first time that you ever come across them. Um, so how are we doing in terms of uh, our creative agenda? Uh, well, uh, one of the um, proudest uh, moments of um, our, our recent history uh, was um, Fast Company uh, recognizing us as one of the world's uh, 50 most creative and innovative uh, companies. And what was really, really brilliant about what Fast Company said to us uh, said about us was, you know, we're a big multinational uh, that has suddenly started to behave like a nimble entrepreneurial marketing organization. And, uh, uh, and that's the highest accolade, because of course, you know, we can't ever take away the resources and the footprint and the scale of the Coca-Cola company business. But what we've started to do is manage the balance of all of that resource and all of that scale and all of that structure um, uh, but with a much lighter, more creative entrepreneurial culture um, uh, that is leading us forward. Um, uh, so how else does creativity impact the Coca-Cola company business? Well, first and foremost for us is it creates reconsideration. Um, you know, we can't change the formula of our drinks. Will we tied us? Should we try? We tried that in America, and it was the most disastrous marketing event ever in the history of humankind. Um, so we'll never do that again. Um, uh, but so we're not like a Nike, and we're not like a Facebook, and we're not like a uh, Apple who can continue to 
uh, inspire different generations of consumers through product uh, innovation. We have to um, base most of our innovation on marketing communications because that's the lever that we can um, uh, change and change quite ra radically. So with that, I'm just going to play this one film that talks about changing uh, consumer reconsideration. at the world and driving reconsideration about Coca-Cola and taking it from a conversation about beverage uh, to a conversation about what's going on in the world at large. Okay, another reason why we believe in creativity is because we believe that creativity sparks brand love. And at Coca-Cola Company, every action that we uh, ever take is measured in two buckets, really. It all boils down to two buckets. One bucket is about um, uh, how many people around the world love our brands, uh, and uh, that's really making sure that we're putting down the legacy for the next generation of marketers and the next generation of consumers, and then, of course, um, the value of our brands. Uh, so something slightly less tangible and something that's really, really tangible. But brand love is very, very important for us. And I always say to any of our, my agencies, guys, I want ideas that are so cool that I'd wear the T-shirt. And I really, really mean that. And if an agency presents an idea that's not that cool that I, would be, I wouldn't want to wear it in the gym, then I'm not sure that it's a cool enough idea for us. This makes a brilliant t-shirt. This came from a 19-year-old student in Hong Kong out of Ogilvy, Shanghai. And um, as soon as I saw it, I was like, it's just gorgeous. It's so cool. I want to wear that t-shirt. And teenagers all over the world share that point of view. So cool, it's driving brand love. Now, this uh, next film comes from our um, business unit in Australia, a film that was produced about two years ago, uh, and that has helped us create brand love all over um, uh, Asia and in some Latin American markets. And most importantly, it helped the Hong Kong business unit uh, win uh, Can Lion Gold as they innovated off the back of this. This thing on Is anybody listening? A brand new day has begun Okay, uh, another reason why we use creativity is uh, creativity looks for new possibilities. And this is a lovely story about one of our mad uh, scientists at Coke. In, in fact, he's global head of science. Uh, a guy called Ed Hayes. 
and he's worked at the company for about 30 years. And uh, each year, he used to fight for this little line of $100,000 so that he could try and crack the code of real Coke taste with zero sugar, with no calories. Um, uh, he was involved in the Diet Coke launch uh, some 30 years ago, um, but he was never satisfied with the taste profile of Diet Coke. He thought we could do better. And everybody just thought that he was a mad guy, and you know they'd give him $100,000, and he'd kind of go off. And, and then eight years ago, he managed to crack it. And um, he came running back into the company, and Australia was the first market to actually launch um, uh, uh, Coke Zero. But there was this one guy for 30 years who was steadfastly obsessed with the fact that we could beat the flavor profile of uh, Diet Coke. And through his creativity, um, uh, we created a new possibility that has become uh, the company's fastest ever um, multi-billion dollar brand. Creativity looks for new capabilities. Uh, just six years ago, we were the poster child for bad recycling practices all over the world. And now, because we've invested in creativity, um, uh, we are held up as one of the world's most progressive um, uh, organizations in terms of um, uh, recycling practices. And we've done that through great partnerships with NGOs and designers and the fashion industry so that we can really reimagine um, uh, uh, some of the uh, waste materials that our business uh, creates. Um, and we wouldn't have had such a, um, a positive impact in terms of recycling had we have not invested in creativity to address that very, very important need for our business. And creativity travels. When I started at the organization, I couldn't tell you, you know, 20 countries. Uh, and now if my work isn't traveling to a minimum of 50 countries, then it's deemed to have failed. And uh, there's no better uh, evidence of uh, how great creativity travels all over the world than our Olympics campaign. The first campaign that I did at the company was the Beijing Olympics. Uh, and at the time, I did you know, um, about 12 pieces of content, film, out of home, some basic shopper, um, a couple of uh, t-shirt designs, and that was it. London Olympics, just four years later, 250 different pieces of content. My production budgets hadn't increased, but the way that we were spending the production budgets was creating much, much more content. And um, in Beijing, the uh, activation only went to 18 markets. 18 markets activated uh, Coca-Cola's um, Beijing presence. In London, it um, increased to 110 markets. And that's because I think we just got better at telling the stories and putting creativity at the heart of those stories. So just take a look at this. Coca-Cola. 
So we just had a bigger idea for the London Olympics than we had for the Beijing Olympics. And that was, that, 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 that was it. Um, and that idea was getting people to really engage with the sound of the London Olympics. And that idea was so fertile that it spawned documentaries, live events, a song, a visual identity system, a clothing range, in, uh, out of home shopper. You know, the idea was so fertile that every aspect of content that was required for us to activate that in 110 markets um, uh, was just very, very easy to extend. What I like about my job is that creativity resets the bar. Um, and uh, it's really interesting because an organization like the Coca-Cola Company, it, the, we want to codify everything. So it's like, oh, what we did in the uh, South African um, FIFA World Cup, that was fantastic. Can we just codify that so we know what to do at the Brazilian World Cup? And I just don't want to codify anything. It's like, oh, no, no, why would we want to codify something that is already going to be four years old by the time we next activate? Um, uh, for us, creativity is about constant innovation. And so therefore, I'm less interested about codifying what's been, and much, much more interested in imagining what's yet to uh, come. Uh, but that's beautiful because you know, it means that the work that we did last year is dull and predictable, and the work that we're going to do next year is yet to be imagined, and therefore very exciting um, and very, very challenging at the same time. Creativity also demands better. It demands better people, better agency relationships, better conversations, uh, better processes, we need to stamp out anything that is getting in the way of uh, really enabling creativity to flourish. And creativity, interestingly, and most importantly, is behind every single leap that's made in science, manufacturing, and marketing. So creativity is not just the remit of a few people. Creativity is the responsibility of everybody in any organization. And this, as this chart shows, I mean, we've made some multi-billion dollar brands because we've used creativity to either make sure that we're creating better liquids or better packaging or better storytelling of our packaging. Um, nothing to do with the kind of creativity that would come out of my world, but everything to do with the way that the company approaches creativity uh, across the entire business spectrum. And the Coca-Cola Company mission is really, really very simple. We're in the business of refreshing the world. If it's not refreshing, we're not going to do it. We're also in the business of inspiring just little moments of optimism and happiness. So we're a company that inspires positivity through optimism and happiness. And we're also a company that is committed to creating value and making a difference wherever we do business. So our mission requires creativity. Because we, without it, we wouldn't be able to refresh or inspire or indeed create the value for all of our shareholders. So now that's some higher order principles and some higher order examples of creativity. I'm now going to narrate um, uh, the company's uh, evolved creative agenda. So if you could play this film. Now, as I say, this film is available online. We've made it open source. And the reason why we've done that is we're inviting feedback and inputs uh, so that we can continue to iterate uh, on this film. Okay, so we're gonna move from creative excellence to content excellence. Can I have a bit more volume, please? Thank you. So chapter one, as a driver of the company's liquid and linked marketing agenda, how does content excellence, which is the discipline that I lead, approach uh, content creation? Well, the purpose of content, create, uh, content excellence is to create ideas that are so contagious they cannot be controlled. And we call this liquid. The ideas are innately linked to our business agenda, our brand agenda, and consumer interests, so it's linked to the business. And through the stories we tell, we will earn our brands a disproportionate share of popular culture. Now, the conversation model that we've developed for all of our brands starts with these brand stories. These brand stories create liquid and linked ideas. These liquid and linked ideas must provoke conversation, and then the Coca-Cola company has to act and react to those conversations 365 days a year. Okay, chapter two. What is the case for change? Why would the Coca-Cola company be committed to evolving its creative agenda? Well, first of all, we've identified three 
key drivers of change. The first is we intend to double the size of our business over the next 10 years across our entire beverage portfolio. That's a lot of incremental servings. Secondly, we've observed this distribution of creativity. No one now has the smarts on creative ideas, and in fact, consumer-generated stories outnumber Coca-Cola company-generated stories on most of our brands. So we need to fuel this newfound creative freedom. And then the third is this distribution of technology. We now have greater consumer empowerment and consumer connectivity than ever before. And this has driven an on-demand culture where consumers can turn their demands on to our marketing 24 hours a day. The growing mobile footprint has had a significant impact on all aspects of marketing, regardless of content needs. The good news is that, creativity, that technology can help us develop better stories. And this is also creating much, much better experiences for anybody watching, reading, listening, sharing, or co-creating with us and our marketing campaigns. So we're now in a position where we can reach more people more often in more places than ever before. So we really need to integrate technologists into our core creative teams and having deep and meaningful relationships with technology companies is a business mandate. So chapter three, the evolution of storytelling. So we need to focus on the evolution of storytelling. And for the Coca-Cola company, we're gonna move from one-way storytelling to what we call dynamic storytelling. So what is the definition of dynamic storytelling? Well, it's the development of incremental elements of a brand idea that get dispersed systematically across a load of connection points for the purpose of creating a unified brand experience. And the role of content excellence is to behave like a ruthless editor. Otherwise, we risk just creating noise for our brands. So we need to develop system-wide capabilities in dynamic storytelling. And we've observed five different types of storytelling that are crucial to the success of our business. Serial storytelling, multifaceted storytelling, spreadable storytelling, immersion and discovery storytelling, and engagement, fan engagement through storytelling. Storytelling is important because it's at the heart of all families, it's at the heart of all communities, and it's at the heart of all cultures. And it's something that the Coca-Cola company has excelled at for 127 years. Okay, chapter four. Baking Live Positively, our sustainability agenda, into our storytelling plans. At the Coca-Cola company, all of our brands have a strategic blueprint that we call the BVA. It's really the strategic map that helps guide all of the marketing teams all around the world. Each one of these strategic um, blueprints has a cultural tension baked in. What we now need to do is make sure that each one of our brands has a very, very clear approach to the company's overall sustainability agenda. And then once we've figured that out strategically, we need to work out how to communicate that to consumers. This is a huge, huge creative opportunity for us. Who in the room isn't inspired by what Nike do with the Nike girl effect? So for the Coca-Cola company, our powerful position in the world affords us the opportunity, but most importantly, the responsibility to ensure that all of our brands succeed in making the world a truly better place. And the live positively principles need to be baked into all aspects of our business and operating principles. Okay, chapter five. Moving from insights to provocations, how are we gonna get to bigger, more fertile, creative briefs? So this next area of evolution is moving from regular insights that everybody sees to bigger provocations, because we need bigger thinking at the heart of all of our strategic briefs. What we observed was a lot of the insights that we were recycling around the system were leading to smaller incremental actions. And what we needed were bigger provocations to lead to transformational actions. We get to those provocations through mining data, 
data becomes the new soil, and data whisperers, creative people that can manage that data, become our new messiahs. Once we have those provocations, it will take us to a liquid and linked creative brief. And for the Coca-Cola company, all of our creative briefs have to have a big, fat, fertile idea at the heart. Now you get to that big, fat, fertile idea through mining data, through collaborating with internal and external collaborators. Importantly, through engaging with consumers, not just through qual groups, but regular online dialogue. So we're developing lots of different tools that can really help us and build our confidence in our creative briefs, becoming some of the world's finest creative briefs. And it's really, really important that we develop all creative briefs in collaboration with our media partners because connections thinking is so now inextricably linked to content thinking. But remember, for the Coca-Cola company, all our creative briefs must have a big, fat, fertile idea at the heart. Okay, chapter six, developing liquid content. So we have this definition of content, and that is the creation of stories that are to be expressed through every relevant connection point. For the Coca-Cola company, our stories have to have value and significance to people's lives because we believe that content is the substance and matter of brand engagement and brand conversation. So simply put, we have to create the world's most compelling content. And we have a definition of liquid. Elements of content that move freely, but they don't become so disconnected because that would be like molecules that become gases if they get too disconnected from liquid. But we've said that all of our ideas now need to be so compelling that they take on a life force of their own. And the fluidity of all of our ideas means that no one model of content creation can do it all for us. So we need to continue to be very innovative in where we get our content. Um, we can work directly with the creative industries, the music industry, the film industry. We can work with our brand fans who are creating so much content. Um, uh, we can work directly with creative talent, photographers and directors. Or we can work with a rock star single agency for all of our content needs. Each one of these has different processes, of course, but they all require the same principles. The most important principle for the Coca-Cola company is to inspire participation amongst the world's finest creative minds. Secondly, it's our responsibility to connect those creative minds and build communities of outstanding creators. And then we're gonna share the results, like I'm doing today, of our learnings. We're obviously gonna to commit to continuous innovation and development, and we're gonna measure our success as we go. So how do we develop a liquid idea? Well, really, the role of the marketing teams of the Coca-Cola company is to govern its flow. It is fluid, but we need to bring out the creativity in everybody that we work with. We want to be seen by the uh, creative industries as a place for brave creativity. We need to ensure that we keep our thinking very, very clear. We need to embrace risk and all that that entails because we want to be perceived as an incubator for some of the world's finest creative ideas. Now this principle is really important. In order to get to the world's greatest creative work, you clearly need conflict. And we all need to learn how to use conflict constructively because we believe that conflict can be a true enabler for outstanding creativity. Chapter seven. So we're nearly there, 10 chapters in total. How do we apply our investment model to the development of content? We have this thing called 70-20-10, and that's where we lay out all of our dollars that we spend and make sure um, uh, that they're working in different ways. 70% of my budget goes on bread and butter content, low risk content. That 70% requires less time. We should all know how to do TV commercials. 
Then I have 20% of my budget, which is where I innovate off what we know works well. This takes more time pro rata. And then I have 10% of my budget. These are brand new ideas. They could be tomorrow's 70 or tomorrow's 20, or they could fail gloriously. We need to declare our learning intent up front, and we need to be really, really clear at celebrating both failure and success. So if you take a look at the global um, Fanta body of work, you could argue that the TVCs, the out of home, the shopper, they're all in the 70%. But the mime spoof campaign that we've got going in Brazil is in the 20. And a big bounce interactive campaign that I developed two years ago, which was a big glorious fail, was in the 10. Chapter eight, and here's where we get a little bit contentious. The research process. Our current approach to research as an industry needs urgent address. 12th Force, Gatorade, second generation Old Spice, Chipotle, all of these fantastic, iconic campaigns that moved the marketing agenda forward for these big brands were all conceived without 30 second TV testing. Why? Because the TV um, uh, slice of a campaign is just a sliver of the creative potential. My business demands liquid content, but the current approach to research either solidifies or evaporates a liquid idea um, before it's truly been birthed. So anything that gets in the way of a liquid idea has to be the enemy. In a liquid and linked world, the Coca-Cola company are gonna increasingly develop ideas that are not 30 second TV centric. So we're looking to the research industry to help us build tools that we can use that can help us measure the potential of an idea and how it's gonna impact popular culture. Chapter nine, applying the dollar multiplier to the iterative production process. So, in a liquid world, we need to make sure that we've got a fluid approach to production. We basically need a lot more content, but I don't have a lot more production dollars. So we need to think about the ways that we spend our production budget. And we've developed this principle called the production multiplier, which I'll share with you in more detail at the workshop that we have on Thursday. What it basically means is that we need to remain flexible about our um, production needs because we won't know what aspects of a campaign are really going to ignite conversation until that campaign actually hits the marketplace. In a liquid world, we have what we call tent pole and tent peg productions because each is vital in helping hold up a different component part of a brand's story. What you're going to see is the Coca-Cola company spending a lot more of its production dollars directly with the production industries. So really remember, don't just replicate your um, content on every different screen. Make sure that you're exploiting the content for the screen you have in mind. So chapter 10, in summary. Well, it's a new liquid world for the Coca-Cola company. And we have a new North Star. We need to produce liquid ideas that earn our brands a disproportionate share of popular culture. And in so doing, we're confident in our part in helping the Coca-Cola company reach its vision 2020 growth objectives. That's all I have for you. Thank you. Thank you.